Hello, Science 30. This lesson is really a continuation of the previous lesson where I talked about electromagnetic radiation, or EMR, and I finished off with this slide here of the electromagnetic spectrum. So just as a little bit of a reminder, it covers this entire range from the very, very short wavelength, high frequency, high energy gamma rays. And then as we go to the right on this diagram anyway, if we take a look at the bottom, we can see what happens to the wavelength is it gets longer and longer. So inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. So the longer the wavelength, the um, lower the frequency is going to be. And the lower the energy is going to be as well. You should also know um, various different uses of different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So obviously visible light is the only portion of it that we can see and also used for photography, taking pictures. That is what is actually captured by the camera. Um, ultraviolet can be used for uh, disinfecting surfaces, for eliminating bacteria and pathogens. Infrared is really heat. So that can be used for cooking food, as of course can microwaves be used, like a microwave oven. Uh, radio TV waves, really for broadcasting, x-rays, pretty clear, taking pictures of bones and teeth. Uh, gamma rays for treatment of cancer. So different uses, in some cases medical uses, of different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this lesson is going to kind of focus on how the electromagnetic radiation does interact with various different materials and what that looks like. So reflection, refraction, polarization, and diffraction is what I'm going to be talking about in this lesson here. So reflection to start off with anyway, relatively straightforward. So we are talking about an image that is well bouncing off some sort of reflective surface. And the ones that I'm showing you here, first of all, because it's gonna be different on the next slide, are flat surfaces. So whether it is the case of uh, this cat looking in the mirror here, that mirror is a flat surface, or taking a look at Mount Rundle up by Banff and reflecting off of the flat horizontal surface that we have of the water surface here. So the picture that I have at the bottom, this dark band that's going across, that is our flat surface. that we're talking about. So a little bit of language that you uh, do need to understand. So incident ray or the incident light is the light that is coming in from the object and bouncing off of the reflective surface. So in this picture here, that object would be the mountain that's coming in and bouncing off of the reflective surface. In the case of the picture on the left-hand side, well, it might be the collar that the cat is wearing that is bouncing off of the reflective surface. So then from the reflective surface, it of course is going to um, somewhat go back, but not in exactly the same direction necessarily. So in the case of Mount Rundle, reflecting off the surface and then going into your eyes. In the case of the cap, the object, the collar reflecting off of the mirror, and then going to the eye of the cap. So that light that is reflected back, it is simply referred to as the reflected light. So we have the incident light coming in, the reflective light that is bouncing off of that reflective surface. If it is a flat surface, then we can also talk a little bit about these angles here. So this dashed line, it is at right angles or perpendicular to the surface. And this line here, it is called the normal line. Normal line is perpendicular to the surface. So if we take a look at this angle here, of the incident ray to the normal line. And if we call this theta one, if we're talking about reflection off of a perfectly flat surface, then the angle that we see here, theta two, is exactly the same. So here it looks like this is about uh, 45 degrees. So if the incident ray is 45 degrees, then for a perfectly flat surface, the reflective ray is going to be, um, sorry, that should be 45 degrees, not percent, 45 degrees as well. <clears throat> so what about if we have not a flat, but a curved reflective surface? So this can definitely 
be the case as well. So let's take a look at the picture here first of all. So this is taking a look at the side view mirror on the car. So the one that's kind of blurry in the background, that is essentially a flat mirror that we're taking a look at there. But this one, this is a curved mirror, and this is what we call a convex mirror. So now when the light comes in and strikes that, it's not going to come straight back, but it's going to go out on an angle. It's going to come in and strike and go out on an angle. Strike here and go out on an angle. So that is why these are called a divergent mirror, is because the light rays, the reflected right ray, light rays, they are being dispersed. So here we can see the angle of light that's coming in. And we would also have a normal angle here. If I just draw one of them. And then that light is reflecting off of this reflective surface. And it's going at a reflected angle, which again, this angle here would be the same as this angle here. Only we have now a convex mirror. So this is very useful for, for sort of widening our view, as we can see with this one here for the rear view mirror. Sometimes when you come out of a uh, parkade in a building, then they would have mirrors like this as well. So you have kind of a wider field of view when you're taking a look at this convex mirror. The other one is, well, exactly the opposite, a concave mirror. So in this case, if we take a look at the picture on the right, first of all, the light rays are coming in and they're all being directed toward this focal point here. So whereas the one at the top is a divergent mirror where these reflected rays are being spread out, this is now a convergent mirror because the rays are all going toward one point, those reflected rays. So this is useful for a telescope. This is showing the setup of what is called a reflective or reflecting telescope. So here we have the light that's coming in from this direction through the tube of the microscope. And then it's going to reflect off of what they're calling the primary mirror, but that is a concave mirror. So what that is doing is it's converging those light rays onto, well, in fact, a secondary mirror here, which is going to bounce them back again. And eventually we can then see whatever we're taking a look at with the telescope through the eyepiece. But we do have, again, a convergent or a concave mirror that's going to be focusing those light rays on a single focal point. Refraction is another property of light. So the picture at the top here, what we have is a laser beam, which is green, and it's going from all around the outside of this block here, which is air, passing into this solid block, which could be glass, or it could be plastic, or any other transparent material. And what we can see is that if we take a look at the angle of this light coming in, notice that it doesn't just continue on that same path, but it actually bends. And then when it comes out of the block and it travels back into the air again, it bends again. So this bending that we see here as it leaves the more dense material and the bending here as it goes into a more dense material, that is what we call refraction. So refraction is just a fancy name for the bending and the bending of the green laser beam in this case. So why does this actually happen? Well, when the light goes from one material into another, if they do have different densities, then we're going to get this bending because the speed of the wave of light is actually going to change. So in the air, it's going to be traveling faster. As it goes into this solid block, it's going to be traveling slower. So as we're going from one medium to another, and this word medium here, we're just talking about different materials. So in this case, it's going from air into the glass or the plastic. So when light travels from a less dense medium, like we do see at the lower left hand side of the picture, which is from air, and it goes into a more dense medium. So here it says water, but it could be again what we see at the top here, the glass or the plastic or any other transparent material. It slows down as it goes into a more dense material and it bends toward the normal. So I'll show you a picture on the next slide, but we did already see what the normal line is. That is the line that is perpendicular to the surface. So we're going to see light that is bending toward this normal line. 
And when light travels in the opposite direction, so what we see going out of the block here, when light travels from a more dense to a less dense material, then it bends in the opposite direction. It bends away from normal in this case. And what we'll also see is that a higher frequency wavelengths, so if we're talking about visible light, that would be like the blue and the purple, uh, the higher the frequency and the lower the wavelength, the greater the amount of bending or refraction is going to be. This picture that we have here, we can, uh, if we follow these arrows, we can see that the light ray is coming from the top and that's why it's called the incident ray. So in this case here, this might be air at the top. So this one would then be less dense a less, less dense material than at the bottom. And let's just say that this one at the bottom here is in fact water. So water is more dense than air. So what happens as this incident light ray strikes the surface? So this is our surface that we have going across the screen. And this is our normal angle, which again is at 90 degrees to the surface, to the actual surface. So we can talk about the angle of light that comes in relative to the normal, and that is the angle of incidence. And here it looks like it's maybe about, oh, 30 degrees for the angle of incidence. So again, that is the angle from the normal to the incident ray. It's not from the surface to the incident ray. So if this light wasn't bent at all, then it would follow through. If I can draw a straight line here, which I may not be able to, it would kind of go in my wiggly direction more like this. But obviously that doesn't happen. So what happens is that right here, as it goes from one surface to another, and the key is in this case, it is going from a less dense material into a more dense material. So what's going to happen is that line is going to shift over and it's going to move toward the normal line. It's going to bend toward the normal line. And this is now our refracted ray. So now we can see that this angle here, that this is our theta 1, and this here is our theta 2. We can see now that they are not the same. So the theta 1 that's coming in, it ends up being greater than the theta 2 coming out. If we reverse this entire thing, if the light ray was going up in the opposite direction, so now we're starting at the bottom, the light is going from the more dense material into the less dense material, we can see that it's still going to bend, only now it would bend away from the normal. So in, when we're going from less dense to more dense, then we're going to have a decrease in the angle of the refracted light, when we're going from more dense to less dense, then we're going to have an increase in the angle of the refracted light. We also see this when we do take a look at a prism. So what a prism does, this is a glass prism, is it takes white light, which is made up of all of the colors, all of the visible colors of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what it does is it splits them up into all of the different colors of the rainbow. So this is our incident light that's coming in and it's striking the prism. So this is our surface that we have. And it's going across on an angle, which means um, at right angles to that, again, if I can draw this as best I can with a straight line, this would be the normal line that we would have when it strikes that surface. So if this light ray was going straight through, it would go through in this direction. But we see that all of these rays, they're being bent. And in which direction are they being bent to? They're being bent toward the normal. Why is that? Because this is coming from air, from a less dense material, into glass, which is a more dense material, and it's being bent toward the normal. But we did see previously that it also depends upon the frequency. So violet light, this is the one that has the higher frequency, larger number of wave peaks are reached per second, and it has the shorter wavelength. Shorter wavelength, I'll just put the symbol for that, which is the lambda. 
So why do we split the white light up into all the different colors? Well, because the purplish light, it is bent the most, and the red light is bent the least. So the red light, it would be the opposite. So instead of having the higher frequency compared to the other colors, it would have the lower frequency, and it would have the longer wavelength. So that's the explanation as to why we do see the white light that's being split up into all the different colors when we do use a prism, or when light coming from the sun is passing through the atmosphere, and there are water droplets in the atmosphere, and now it's the water in the atmosphere that's going to act as a prism, and that's what's going to generate the rainbow that we see. You do not need to do any calculations for this in Science 30, but this table does show us some information that is still kind of useful. So these are different mediums. So what I'm saying for this first one here is we're going always from air. So this one is always going to be, in the case here, the less dense material, and it's always going into a more dense material. The incident angle is always exactly the same, but the refracted angle, this one here is not the same. So what do we have the largest amount of bending with? The most dense material. So out of all these ones here, diamond is the most dense. So now we have the biggest difference between the incident light and the refracted light. Again, we won't get into the calculations, but we can use these numbers here and we can come up with uh, what I show here is N, it's referred to as the refractive index. So the more dense the material is that the light is passing into, the higher the refractive index. So if we take a look at these numbers alone, we could say that diamond is the most dense material, followed by ice, followed by water. Oops, sorry, I'm doing that wrong here. The diamond, first of all, followed by the glass, and then the plastic the water, and finally the ice, being the least dense out of all of these ones that we have here. Just like there are convergent and divergent or curved mirrors, there are also curved surfaces that light can pass through. So in this picture here, this is uh, labeled as a converging lens, but the shape of this is actually convex and it's di-convex because it kind of bulges out on both sides. So here we have the light that's coming in. So this is the incident light that's coming in from the left-hand side. Now the surface is not perfectly lined or perpendicular to that incident light, but it's on an angle. So this would be the surface that I'm drawing here, and the dashed line, that is the normal line. So when the light strikes that surface, when it goes from the less dense to the more dense material, it's bent toward the normal. And then we can see it's bent again when it's going from the less, the more dense to the less dense material. So this kind of lens, it is called a converging lens because it does converge those light rays onto one single focal point. So this is the kind of lens that is used in a camera <clears throat> for photography. This is the kind of lens that is in your eye. And what it does is it takes in those light rays and it converges them upon one single focal point at the back of the camera or the back of your eye, the retina of your eye. The other kind of uh, lens that we have here, so again, this is a transparent lens that the light can pass through. This is a diverging lens or a concave lens. And again, this one would be biconcave because it caves in on both sides. So we can see here that the light ray that's coming in, again, taking a look at the normal dashed line that we see here, which is perpendicular to this line. It's now bending away from that, or sorry, toward that, because we're going from the less dense to the more dense. But if we follow the pattern of the bending here, we can see that these light rays, they're not converging. They're doing the opposite. They are diverging. So that is why it's called a divergent or diverging lens. And this is a concave lens. So back to reflection for a minute here, um, something that is called total internal reflection that you definitely do need to know for Science 30. Let's just kind of jump down to the picture at the bottom. So what it shows this blue bar across the bottom, it is a more dense material. So in this case, it's water, but it could be glass, it could be plastic, it could be uh, some other transparent material. 
and this is the less dense air. So in this case here, the incident light wave, it's starting out in the more dense material. And we can see that when it goes from that interface between the water and the air, that we do have the bending of the light. And because we're going from more dense to less dense, it's actually bending away from the normal in this case. So theta two would end up being larger than theta one. But now what they're showing is we're gonna bump up this incident angle until we reach what is referred to as the critical angle. So notice at this point, that light ray actually is no longer going outside of the water or outside of the solid block of glass or plastic that we have. And now if we increase that angle even more, none of that energy, that light is escaping outside of this more dense material. So what's gonna happen is it's just gonna keep bouncing around inside of it without any of that light escaping. So light of course is a form of energy and this is a very, very efficient way of transmitting energy through the use of fiber optics. And that's exactly what is going on with fiber optics is total internal reflection. So in the case here, the light ray that we have, it has reached that critical angle. It's more than the critical angle. So no light is escaping at any point along here to the outside of this glass or plastic tube. So we're transmitting the incoming energy completely through this tube until it reaches the other end. And we can see in this picture at the bottom here with fiber optics that we can see the light that's coming out of the end, but it doesn't escape anywhere along the length of the fiber optic. So again, very efficient way of transmitting energy without any loss of energy. And that is through this total internal reflection. So the third property of light here is a polarization, or rather the third change that can take place depending upon the material that it's interacting with. So let me just remind you again, that light that's coming from a typical light source, like an incandescent light, or a fluorescent light, or the sun, it is not polarized. So that's what it's initially showing here. Remember that um, when we're talking about EMR, it's made up of an electric and a magnetic component. They're just showing the electric field component here. So yes, it's going up and down. It's going horizontally. It's going at every possible angle. So this is unpolarized light because it does have the light that's traveling at every possible angle. So keep in mind as well that we are talking about a wave that's traveling like this, going across the stream from the left to the right, but when you take a look at it coming right toward you, what you see is this, that wave going up and down. But also, there's one that's going left and right, and also going at all of these other possible angles, and that's what it's trying to show here. So if we do have polarized light that is generated by using what is called a polarizing filter. So kind of think of it like this, it is a filter that's going to remove all of the different angles except for one of those angles. Okay, so kind of like a filter. So in this case here, it has the axis as being vertical, going up and down. And what that means is it's going to filter out all of these other angles except for this one electric field that's vibrating up and down. So that one can pass through, all of the other ones are blocked out or filtered out. So as soon as it passes through this, it doesn't have it at all the different angles. It is not unpolarized. So now it is what we call polarized light. So if we were to take one polarizing filter, which filters out all of them except for the vertical one. So that's like this picture at the lower left-hand side. Again, it's unpolarized light that we have coming in. And then right after that, what we have is the polarized light and we only see the vertically polarized light. But what happens if you put another polarizing filter right after it, which is at exactly the opposite orientation? So now we have it going horizontal. So now it's going to filter out all of those vertical rays. And what's coming out the other end? Well, there's no light that's coming out the other end, so it would be completely dark. You may have heard or you may use 
uh, polarized glasses, polarized sunglasses. And the idea behind this is if you're driving down a road, for example, and you have a horizontal surface, then light rays that are coming in and striking off of those will bounce off of that horizontal surface and you'll have this reflection that's going into your eyes and that might impair your vision when you're driving. So what polarized sunglasses are going to do is they're going to take those light waves that are vibrating parallel to the highway or the horizontal surface and it's going to filter those out. So you can still see because all of the other waves are still passing through, it's just the ones bouncing off of that horizontal surface that are being filtered out. The last one that I have is called the diffraction. So diffraction is referring to the bending of light as it passes either around a corner or going through a hole. So it's not just light that does this, sound does this, and waves and water, they do this as well. So if we do have a corner, and I'll draw this as best I can. This is my corner. So if you're sitting here, or standing here, around the corner, and someone else is over here, and they are talking, so now we're talking about sound waves, well, you know that, well, you don't need to be standing perfectly in line. You don't need to be able to see that person in order to hear them. Because what happens is those sound waves are going to bend around the corner and you're still going to be able to hear. It may not be quite as loud, may be a little bit muffled, but you can still hear it. So that happens with sound and it also happens with, with light waves as well. So the amount of bending that does take place, so usually what we are talking about is traveling through a hole like it shows in this picture on the right hand side. So the amount of bending depends upon the relative size of the wavelength of the light relative to the size of the opening. So if we do have the size of this opening that is about the same size as the wavelength of light, then as it passes through, we're gonna get this particular what is called diffraction pattern which are all of these concentric rings. If it was a much larger hole, larger than the wavelength, then we don't see as much of that bending. But the smaller the hole and the closer it is to the actual wavelength of the light, then the more of this bending we're actually going to see. So what does it look like when you take a picture of this? So here we have a single hole and we can see this concentric ring, the one at the bottom, is kind of similar to it where we have these dark and light shaded patterns that we do see here. Um, if you have two holes that allow the light to pass through, at some points the light coming from one will interfere with the light coming through the other hole. So we have these interference patterns and we see these concentric rings still but they're in the form of, of bands. And then if we move those two holes a little bit further apart we can see that there are these uh, narrow bands. But anytime you see a pattern like this, what we are talking about is the bending of light as it passes through one of these tiny little holes or a slit, it could be either, any corner that's small enough, and we get this particular diffraction pattern.